So no financial arrangements, no corporate organizations, anything, uh, no conflict of interest here. So learning objective wise, <clears throat> we're gonna summarize recommendations from clinical practice guidelines. Guess what month it is? Do y'all know what month it is? You're here, right? It's January. That's an important month in the diabetes world because Diabetes Care, the main journal of diabetes management, releases their updated guidelines every January. So I'm going to tell you about some of the major points that are in those new updated guidelines today, right? You come here. I had to put it together right before I sent it to Charlene. That's why my slides were late, by the way. All right. So, um, so we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about evidence for oral therapies primarily. I could talk a whole day about insulin, um, but I'm not. And then we're going to talk about GLP-1 agonists and then even some newer agents that are kind of GLP-1s, kind of something else, right? And then we're going to discuss the evidence and role of SGLT-2 inhibitors within diabetes and non-diabetes. Wow. SGLT-2s, right? They're everywhere right? We're being using them for things. Diabetes is just one of many things that we're using them for. So it's, it's a pretty exciting time, honestly, in the management uh, of diabetes. Um, used to be kind of, you know, metformin and friends, metformin and others that we really don't want to use. Um, but now it's getting fun. Like we've got some really good data for some of these products. So in the course of your daily practice, how often do you receive questions from diabetes patients regarding newly approved agents. So how many of you would say daily? Not really daily, okay. How about weekly? Yeah, a lot of heads going up and down weekly. How about monthly? Yeah, got some monthly here, right? We get a lot of questions, a lot of questions. Um, what are some of the questions you get? How expensive, that's the number one. How much is my Monjero journey gonna cost me? Okay. Lose weight. Yeah. How much weight will I lose? I've got a story about actually one of my staff members that's on one of these and kind of her journey through that. I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. How much weight will I lose? How much is it going to cost? Right. What else? What's interesting to me is none of them goes, is this going to decrease my risk of morbidity and mortality? We talk about that. And we're going to, right. And that's important, but you know, it's interesting, a patient perspective from our perspective sometimes, you know, and what they're very interested in is the weight loss. That is by far the number one question we are getting. So we will talk about that. So which of the following non-metformin drug classes do you prescribe or are you seeing prescribed most often? How many of you would say now the DPP-4 inhibitors like Genuvia? No, so it's gone down, right? A lot. How about uh, GLP-1 agonists? my hands there and then sglt2s all right so a little bit of both i saw hands from both sides this is kind of the last two a debate right so my students they hate when they get on my rotation because i make them debate each other they don't want to they don't want to debate each other they want to hurt each other's feelings like oh i'm sorry i'm sorry i beat you you know i'm like debate make it happen i, I want a good debate i want to laugh i want to be educated and I want you to show me you did work. So yesterday I had to fly here. And so I couldn't be at the hospital with them. And I said, all right, y'all going to do a debate when I get back. And here's your debate topic. And they were just petrified, Andy. They were like, what? You're making us debate. I'm like, yes, I am. So I'd make them debate SGLT2s versus GLP1s as the next drug after metformin. And it was a good debate. Always was because there's good arguments really for both of them. And we'll talk about some of those arguments today. But it truly is like an exciting time. Like you're getting to like have some choice in what we do. Um, let's talk about diabetes prevalence. So these are the number of adults diagnosed age 18 or older with diabetes from 1980. I was four years old in 1980. Okay. All the way to a decade ago. And you can see like a steady climb. And this, this, particular chart the CDC. I tried to find a newer one. It was hard to find, but you're talking about 20 million 18 or older. And that number is just escalating even more and more worldwide. You're talking about hundreds of millions of patients with diabetes. Now, I know that you went to 
you know, whatever school you did, because you like science, right? You like science, STEM. Yeah, you guys are not really excited about science right now. All right, so you're like beach, water, sun, sun, okay? But you know what? I thought today, man, how many of you actually like geography? Do you like maps? I mean, you traveled here. You had to figure that out, right? So I thought today we're going to do a little maps. Diabetes prevalence. So I stopped it at 2012 for a reason, right? And if you look here, the darker the green, the worse. You don't want to be dark green, okay? So this is diabetes prevalence by states in the United States. So find your state on the map. You guys remember that? Like find your state. Remember when it was easy like that, right? So I live basically right there. I technically live in South Carolina. I live in a town called Hardyville. No Hardys in Hardyville. It's a tragedy. All right. Less obesity there. All right. So, but uh, Savannah is right on the coast. And so Hardyville, I can be from my house in Hardyville to downtown Savannah, my favorite pizza place, Vinnie Van Gogh goes in 17 minutes flat. So I'm right on the border. Okay. But find your state, right? So this is 2012, right? Dark green, right? Man, it's rough. All right. Now we got some even cooler maps coming. So the CDC has now what the, these even more intense maps on how prevalent is obesity and diabetes in the U.S. Now it gets a little trickier here. There's Des Moines, Iowa, Nebraska, right? It's kind of hard to see. But as you see here, this is diabetes. So the higher up here, these colors, more diabetes. And as you go this way, it's more obesity. So these are the colors that we're really looking at because the dark purple is going to be high levels of obesity. And if you're dark green, that's essentially high diabetes and high obesity. So the green and the purple, the dark, is what I want you to watch as we go from map to map. So what were y'all doing in 2004? I asked my students this and they're like, uh we were barely born. And I was like, okay, fair enough, All right? 2004, I had just changed my position at my job. I was in internal medicine. I went more to critical care and ID, but it was a great year. It's been almost 20 years, 20 years ago. Can y'all believe that? Okay, that's 2004. Now watch what happens when I go just a few years later. Y'all see that purple and green? Watch it. Six years later, what? Boom. Dark, right? Bad. So now we got, it's, and it used to be just the South, right? You know, Waffle House, okay? Waffle, I love Waffle House. Don't get me wrong. My wife ruined my life. I'm married. I have three kids, okay? And I horrified my kids. I took them to the Waffle House. I, I probably traumatized them for life. But I used to love their chocolate pie. You ever had chocolate pie at the Waffle House? Well, I thought they made it. Well, my wife like ruined my life when she goes, you know, that's Sarah Lee, right? And I just sat here and just in my booth, crushed. All right. So anyway, the South, but see, it's not just the South. Now it's spreading. Okay. Now it's the Midwest. They're getting dark. They're getting more purple, right? Obesity going up 2010. All right. Let's go a few years later. Oh man, now it's getting up here, Minnesota. We had a we had a uh, attendee. Anybody from Wisconsin? Yeah, you from Wisconsin? Excellent. So he told me he said we have something we call SOD, and I was like, what? And he goes, seasonal obesity disorder. He said when it gets really cold outside, people aren't going to walk, they're not going to exercise, and they put on twenty to twenty pounds, and then they lose it in the summer. It's very interesting. So, but you can see. It's getting even darker. Now, I found an even more updated map recently. Ooh, this one. Uh, parental advisement is given. I mean, it's like whew, obesity. Diet. Look at this. It's just so dark purple in so many areas. Even Alaska. Look at Alaska, right? So cold all the time, right? Even though they got sunlight, right? A lot of times. That'd be weird, though, going to bed. Lights outside. Anybody from Alaska? No? We usually have a couple of Alaska attendees. Um, 
so you can see how prevalent. So this is not going away. And we're going to be dealing with this. And I wish there was a diabetes vaccine. Wouldn't that be nice? Get a little injection once a year. You're in your cells. No resistance. Waffle House, whatever. No, unfortunately, it doesn't exist. Okay. So let's talk about medication use. How common is it? Here's the problem. It's common. It's very common. But how many people are walking around Fort Myers, Florida right now with diabetes and they don't even know it? They don't even know it, right? Their A1C is eight, nine. They don't know it. They're just walking around because what's been happening over the last three years? What are y'all seeing in your clinics? Sedentary, right? People are depressed more. School-age children. Right. Talked to a lot of parents. Schools were locked down. Kids weren't going. They were just on Zoom for tried doing a school on Zoom for years. It's hard enough with college kids, much less sixth graders. <laughs> I have a seventh grader. OK. So what else was happening? Sedentary. I agree. That was bad. Nobody was going for their visits. Everybody's behind. I have something to admit to you all today. I'm behind. I'm behind on two things. And my wife told me, you got to go fix them. And I'm like, you're right. First thing I'm behind on is just my annual visit. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, one of the residents that I trained when he was a family medicine resident, he's now my doctor. Okay. Because I had to scout him out and make sure he's good. Okay. Make sure you're okay before I let you poke and prod me. Okay. And he's excellent. And he'll shoot me a text every once in a while. I hadn't seen you in a bit. Where have you been? Sorry, I'll get there. So I got to do my annual. But here's the other thing. I'm 46 years old. So what happened in the last couple of years that now I'm in the window? Colonoscopy. Urgh. Yeah, it used to be 50. I was good. Now, now it's I'm in the window. So, um, so I got to schedule my colonoscopy in the next month or so. So I'm trying to find a good time. I'm thinking March Madness, like basketball, lots of games on. You know, that's the number one time for vasectomies. It's a true story. No, I'm not kidding. So men get vasectomies during the uh, NCAA basketball tournament because they can get it, and then they they have to stay home for a couple of days, and they just watch basketball all day long. So I'm thinking that might be it for colonoscopy. Although colonoscopy shouldn't be near as – problematic hopefully yes if what's available oh i'm sure there was shortage of everything mm -hmm. good on preps now yeah yeah so I got to get that done, but we're all behind on our stuff, right? So <clears throat> behind, so, cold, you know, cancer screening, uh, just general health, <laughs> getting evaluated, detection of disease. So we're just, we're not even close to seeing like what this has done. I, I, I predict we're going to see an explosion of the two things y'all said, sedentary lifestyle, lack of evaluation in our clinics. Um, both of those things together, we're going to see an explosion of disease. So um, it's going to be interesting going forward. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of use. Why is this such a difficult disease? So I call it, although I stole this term, the ominous octet. So all roads in diabetes, ultimately, when you make the diagnosis, are due to hyperglycemia. But that hyperglycemia is due to so many different factors, which is why there's so many different drug targets. So um, I have three kids. My two daughters, one is a freshman in college. The other is a senior in high school. They both want to do nursing, NP, okay? So they're, they're texting me. They want the freshman, and she's, she's, she just got accepted, essentially. So... So she's asking a lot of questions. She's like, dad, pharmacology, everybody's so scared of it here. I was like, that's okay. You will own it. 
your dad. I'll come in there and speak to all your nursing students. I said, we will own it together. She's like, okay, okay. But I, I told her, she, I said, if you know pathophysiology, you will know pharmacology. They go hand in hand. So my students, even the pharmacy students, you know, I'll ask them a question about a side effect. You know, I'll say, give me three side. They can tell me all day long that if somebody gets diabetes, put them on metformin or an SGLT2. But then I'll say, what are the three primary side effects of SGLT2 inhibitors? Oh, uh, and I'm like, how do they work? They're called SGLT2. How do they work? Um, so pharmacology really goes hand in hand with pathophysiology, right? So glucose reabsorption, SGLT2s, right? What are they doing? They're essentially causing more glucose to be excreted in your urine. It's like a very nicely tidy DKA, although not DKA, okay? It's getting you out, getting that sugar out, right? Insulin resistance, so your TZDs, right? Y'all are like me, man. How many of y'all remember the drug Regulin? Troglitazone, y'all remember that drug? You put it out of your memory. All right, it got pulled off the market. It was the first thiazolidinone, kind of like Actos Navandia. Okay. It was the first one, but it caused so much liver toxicity that scared people to death. The TZDs were supposed to be that drug. They were supposed to be the SGLT2 because in animal studies, they essentially prevented insulin resistance. People had no insulin resistance. They were able to, you know, use the sugar that was in their bloodstream, hyperglycemia, didn't translate to humans. That happens, right? It happens. That's why we call it translational research. The idea is we translate it from the lab to the patient, but that doesn't always happen. You've got uh, increased incretin effect, right? So a lot of drugs we talk about are incretin analogs or GLP-1s, right? Glucagon secretion. So there's just so many different areas that we can attack this problem, but there's nothing that really cures this problem, bariatric surgery, maybe. We'll talk about that as a very controversial thing. Um, when I ran my clinic, I had a certain provider. He's an internal medicine doctor, fat, probably the smartest guy I've ever met. And I knew how to get him mad. So I would say things like, you know, bariatric surgery is so awesome, isn't it, Hansi? Because we can just cure everybody's diabetes, knowing that that would just set him off. Like, no, it doesn't. We'll talk about why. Anyway, it's a lot of fun. All right. How are we doing? What time is it? 838. We're already 38 minutes in y'all. How's it going? I'm keeping you awake. All right. Let's have some fun. Okay. So GF, 42 year old male diagnosed with new onset diabetes based on A1C of 7.2. Okay. He weighs hundred kilos and he's five foot 10. He's otherwise asymptomatic. His only complaint fatigue, a little bit of fatigue. Aren't we all fatigued though, right? Like some of these side effects, it's like, that's why people go months and months and months and months, right? And they just think it's normal. How many of y'all diagnosed a diabetes person, right? And they tell you, oh my gosh, the last year I have felt so tired. And they, th they just thought they were tired from life, tired from COVID, tired from everything, right? That's one of the problems with long COVID, right? Fatigue for months and months and months, okay? Past medical history, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and GERD, takes lisinopril, simvastatin, and omeprazole. Chem 7 shows his labs are within normal limits, okay? So what agent are you putting him on? Now, I know the answer to this, but I just want to hear you say it out loud. You're doing glipizide, aren't you? No, I'm just kidding. Metformin, right? You're going to do metformin. Now, what's really interesting and we're going to talk about a lot of drugs today, right? But new y'all, for the first time, the guidelines are starting to crack a little bit that maybe metformin shouldn't be the first drug. Whoa. Stop the madness, as Mr. Wonderful would say on Shark Tank, okay? I was like, man, I could, anytime I travel, Shark Tank's on from like 8 to 12. I just sit there and watch it. Like, I love this. Okay. Um, but we're starting to see what are the options by guanides. Next time you're at a party, like with your, your friends in healthcare, just say, did y'all read that article on the by guanides? <laughs> right? I do. That's what we do. And we're like, I have not. Well, you don't know what you're missing. All right. 
that's metformin y'all all right so it just sounds really cool all right sglt2s glp1s we're going to talk about those a little bit of combination not much i'll mention that briefly but those are the ones we're going to focus on today the dpp4s we'll talk a little bit about as well but we're going to spend some time on certain of these i can't cover all of them in one talk or else we'll be here all day now this is kind of what i was getting to Notable changes. So I'm going to tell you what happened in the diabetes care guidelines a year ago, and then I'm going to show you what happened like two weeks ago, okay? Because it's been a long three years. So I like to give a couple of years of data because quite frankly, I feel like 2020s in a way, I feel like it just happened, but I also feel like it's been like decades. Like it just feels like it's so long practicing in this window. So they've put some cost tables in there. I love diabetes care guidelines. Why? Because most guidelines are what? They're clinical guidelines. Here's the trial. Here's the study. Here's, you know, the outcome. Wonderful. Congratulations. You got a drug that decreases the risk of MI and stroke. I think that's wonderful. You go talk to your patient about it. Here's the copay. $500. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm not doing it. Okay, story over, <laughs> right? And so when we think about that, that's why I really like these guidelines because in reality, um, guidelines are clinical and they really have to have a practical aspect. So they do a good job with that. So if you're going to use insulin for type 2 diabetes, a big question that used to come out was, do I need to, like, once you've made the decision, somebody's going on insulin, like they're just long-term, that's this what's left. Do you keep metformin or not? Should you? Because you're on insulin now. Like, what's the point? But actually, the recommendation due to some, um, a number of smaller type studies is, yeah, go ahead and keep the metformin on board. Even though they're on insulin, they're on Lantus, they're on a little Novolog, go ahead and keep that on board. But... GLP-1 agonists, if you can use them in combination, do that. Do y'all do that? Do y'all use some GLP-1s in combination with insulin? Yeah? Some? A little bit? What's the, what's the thought process behind that, you think? Any ideas why that might be a good idea? So insulin causes a lot of weight gain. GLP-1s, cause weight loss. So the idea is that you're balancing some of that weight gain with some weight loss and maybe overall long-term, because we know what obesity does to morbidity and mortality. That's the thought process is try to keep them on as little insulin as possible. Um, and then further harmonization of ADA and other guidelines. So um, one of the problems with guidelines is, especially in the cardiovascular endocrine realm, they're all overlapping. You know, that's why I like ID guidelines. There's one society, IDSA. Here's the guy. Well, it's a lie, actually. I just told a lie in front of everybody. I apologize. Certain disease states and ID, there are multiple guidelines, like C. diff. There's IDSA. There's the American College of Gastroenterology. And there's even European guidelines, okay? It was funny, though, because I just wrote a paper on this and published it. And I'm, I, I'm like a pop culture guy. Like, I love it, as you can probably tell, Waffle House, stuff like that. But I titled the paper, Is Three Company or a Crowd? Three's Company, y'all remember that? All right, I'm just saying, that was, that was I'm still not, you know, I'm 46, okay? Um, but the problem is with diabetes, there's multiple guidelines. There's American Heart Association, they give their recommendations about what blood pressure meds you should give to somebody with diabetes, heart failure, and then you got the ADA. But they say, stop the madness. Metformin may not be first. What? That's going to be hard to erase in our brains, though, isn't it? Like, that's going to be hard. I don't think that's going to happen. I still think most people metformin. We're going to talk about why that is, okay? But it at least cracks open the door. Because let's be honest for a second. Metformin's overall data for decreasing risk of heart attack or stroke is actually not that great. It's based on a subset of about 300 patients. So it doesn't hurt people, but like, how good is it? I don't know, but there are good reasons to use metformin. We'll talk about that. Looking at comorbidities, weight loss, a big one, having those discussions with our patients. I had one patient was talking to him. Their A1C was like 10 and a half. And they're like, I don't care what you tell me. I'm not giving up my frosted flakes. 
So every time I see frosted flakes now, I won't even allow my kids to have it. I'm just kidding. All right. So Tony the Tiger, man, got to have it. All right. So again, it, it's it's having those discussions with patients. Okay. So what about 2023? So this was literally just published two weeks ago. Okay. So obesity is a chronic disease. So what's happening now, and you're going to see this, you watch over the next year, there's going to be a lot of CEs. And there's going to be a lot of discussion on just obesity as like a standalone. How do we tackle this disease? Because for a long time, it's always been kind of on the fringe. Like, okay, we're going to treat diabetes. Do they have obesity? We're going to treat hypertension. Now it's like, okay, we got to fix obesity. How do we do that? And what we're finding out now is that there's some really cool research going on um, in the ID world. I can tell you, microbiome. Like the things that we're exposed to early on in life, right? It's, it's, it's some genetics. It's a lot of environmental factors. It's incredibly complex. It's incredibly complex. I mean, I look at my own family. I mean, you know, you got siblings. Some really struggle with their weight. Others, not so much. They eat a lot of the same diet. Um, so, I, you know, um, I'll tell you my story. I used to be 260 pounds. So I'll tell you about how I lost it. Y'all know how I lost it? colon cleansing. I'm just kidding. I didn't really do that. Y'all are like, oh my gosh, this guy's for real. I'll tell you how I lost it when I get to the bariatric surgery part. It wasn't bariatric surgery, but I'll tell you that story. But I mean, seriously, like my brother, his whole life, very thin, no issues, could eat whatever he wanted, metabolize like crazy. I mean, we're from the same mom and dad, but I, it was a struggle for me for a lot of years. Still is. It's a daily struggle, especially being here, right? Good food, good drink. It's hard. Okay. So obesity is a chronic disease. So there's a big target for, Hey, let's get 10% of their weight off. If we can do that. And, and of course now a lot of these drugs that we're going to talk about, they can do that. They can do that. Um, Mongero is definitely a glucose lowering options. FDA approved for weight loss. I will talk about it in here in just a second. There is potential, but as of January 20th, 2023 is not FDA approved for weight loss. I'm sure it will be soon, but I don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, frail patient glucose targets. I really like this discussion because it talks about, you know, really for patients that, you know, they're 82, like my grandfather. Okay. He passed away nearly 20 years ago. Okay. He was 81 years old when he got diagnosed with diabetes. 81. He met the criteria. The A1C, I think at that time was seven, not 6.5 like now. But um, yeah, he, he had diabetes. So they gave, put him on like glipizide, you know? And I'm just like, now we would be like, no, like never do that, right? And he had hypoglycemia from it because he was barely, you know, barely had it. Today, like, I don't even know if he'd have been treated with anything. I think they would just know like, okay, you're 81. You're frail. He had Alzheimer's disease. He He was in a assisted living home for about seven years, uh, tore my mom to pieces. Um, but uh, it's tough. Alzheimer's heart disease, right? Yeah, I'd go and talk to him, sit with him for an hour. He wouldn't know who I was. But man, that guy was awesome. My grandfather, what a great man. Served in Korean War, World War II, was in Normandy. Like big time, right? Amazing guy. But he wouldn't be treated today. I'd have been like, if I'd have seen that, I'd have been like, stop, lip is that, right? So 50% is kind of our time and range. Like, eh, that's fine, right? Because their length of life, expected length of life is not that long, okay? And less than 1% time below range, we do not want them hypoglycemic because that can kill them. They fall, they pass out, you name it. All right, that's good. I did a talk one time with a geriatrician and I think he, he had a talk. It was basically just talking about how you know, and I'll talk about this tomorrow with polypharmacy. Um, but, you know, no good guideline goes unpunished, you know, like there's tons of them. And so there's always like, we're, we're, we're so wired to do what guidelines say. And we have to remember these are patients. Um, so it'll be a great discussion tomorrow. Um, okay. Real quick. I just want to show you this. I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. If you have type 1 diabetes, there is a table in there with a lot of different insulin type regimens. It's not a, a focus of my talk today, but these guidelines are free, just so you know. So most guidelines from 
big organizing bodies, American Diabetes Association, et cetera, they're free. So if you go, if you Google ADA guidelines 2023, it will come up and it will be free. You can download it. And number nine is the one on drugs. I just know it because it comes out every year. Okay. But there's like, I mean, and especially like if you're having troubles, like tomorrow we're going to talk about hypnotics, right? Polypharmacy, right? If you're if your patient says, look, I can't get to sleep, I would hand them a you know, a couple copies of the diabetes care guidelines and just say, read this, they'll fall asleep very quickly. Okay. Cause it's like hundreds of pages. Just tell them, just say, just read this as long as you can. They'll pass out. I'm just kidding. But anyway, I always joke with my students because I have some faculty. They are totally clueless. Y'all. I love them. They're my friends. They're, they're totally clueless. They'll be like, read eight guidelines, read eight. I'm like, you don't really think they're doing that. Do you like, seriously? So I tell them and they love me. They're like, Dr. Bland, we really love that. You just say, read the tables. That's it. Read the tables. Why? Because everything important just about is in a table. Why do I know that? Because I author public or textbook chapters. And they tell me McGraw Hill education. They tell me got to go on a table because otherwise nobody's going to read it. Right. This isn't common. It's these young faculty, man, young whippersnappers. All right. So anyway, that's the type one table. I won't speak a little about there. Now, they've updated this table now. This is very thin, but these are the type things we're thinking about. Efficacy. Does this drug cause hypoglycemia or not? What's the risk? Okay. So a drug like metformin, no. Glipizide, yes. Globuride, even worse. Okay. Cardiovascular effects. Does it affect mace? Does anybody know what mace is? Not that mace. Pull out your purse, you know, nail somebody. Yeah, major adverse cardiovascular events. So MI, stroke, et cetera. So that's kind of the term that the FDA uses. So the FDA requires of every diabetes drug manufacturer that it's not good enough to say I low, it lowers the blood sugar congratulations. What you have to prove is that you decrease the risk of major adverse cardiac event, or if you're at least neutral to that. Because what do most people with diabetes die from? Cardiovascular disease, right? That's what they die from, a heart attack, stroke, heart failure, okay? Renal effects. Oh, man, we're going to talk about that. Oral versus sub-Q. That, now, that is an interesting discussion right now. We'll talk about that. And then a whole host of clinical considerations, okay? And then cost, very, very important. So in the guidelines, they give these tables. You follow it from left to right. Again, you can pull them up for free where you can see them a little bit bigger if you'd like. But essentially on the left-hand side, right, when you get on the green top here, it says healthy lifestyle behaviors, diabetes, self-management, education, social determinants of health. So just kind of trying to see, okay, what's preventing them from getting healthcare? Are they even accessing healthcare? That's what we talked about earlier. Um, and then the goal, cardiovascular risk reduction. Now, one thing you don't see up here, right, is metformin is there, but it's not first. And so they talk about ASCVD, heart failure, CKD. So they really are pushing to go for these either GLP-1s with those benefits or SGLT-2s with those benefits first. And then over here, what are the other goals? Glycemic and weight management. So weight management is actually in one of the goals now as of 2023, evaluating this. They even talk about medications for weight loss and consider metabolic surgery. Not sure if y'all are aware, first time I've ever seen it, there is actually now a weight loss drug guideline. Just got published about three months ago, okay? The author, I think, starts with a G. I'm trying to remember it. I think I've got it on one of our slides here. But there is, it talks about all the different drugs for weight loss. So amphetamines, you know, Xenical. Oh, yeah. Orlistat. Oh, yeah, baby. If you cheat you will be found out. All right. So, um, and then it talks about efficacy for weight loss. So it gives the drugs that have a lot of good weight loss data.
from very high to neutral um, and in between. So it's good. But you guys are the ones caring for patients. So let's talk about what are the factors that y'all use? I mean, there's a lot of them up here, right? What's what's the prime, what's the number one thing that y'all do? Or is there a number one or is it a combination? Yeah. Cost. So it truly is like if they can afford it. So you still use a lot of glipizide, don't you? You do, right? So our we have an indigent care clinic in town, and yeah, they, they still use a lot of glipizide and glabuide, and our patients do. Yeah. How do y'all ever how painful is it to get like a coupon or do y'all use uh, any of the coupons available? Are there any companies y'all have had good um, results with? Good RXs. Don't have insurance, cash pay. Oh man, cash pay. Yeah, yeah. And they're not going to get it. Absolutely. Yeah. What are y'all's thoughts? Y'all agree with that? Any thoughts on acquisition? So one of our, my partner, actually Chelsea Keaty, who's going to be speaking at the February meeting in Vegas, um, she does a lot of that sort of work where she'll, contact, you know, XYZ company and see like, can we get a prior authorization for indigent care? And she does a lot of that work on the side. And I really feel like if there were more pharmacists within clinics, that would be a big part of the, of what they did. Cause we do it on the side anyway, um, to be able to get a copay for $25 or a copay for $50, something that's more affordable than, you know, a thousand dollars. But yeah, the cost is, is definitely, um, the number one thing is if it's not cheap, they're not going to take it. Um, okay, let's move on here. All right, let's talk about metformin. So why is metformin still like a first-line drug? Well, number one, it's neutral, or like I said, in 300 people, it's fine on mortality. It's not the greatest, biggest study ever. So the FDA mandated everybody from here on out do a larger study, okay? Generically available. It's cheap, right? Weight loss are neutral, okay? And no hypoglycemia at monotherapy. So it has a lot of those characteristics that we like. Does anybody ever have any patients complain to you about the smell of metformin, right? By the way, there are some generics where metformin smells bad and your patients will stop taking it because they think it's rancid. The reason I know that, it happened in Augusta. We had a, a family medicine physician. He called my partner. He's like, y'all got a problem with your metformin down in the pharmacy? And he's like, I don't know what you're talking about. And he's like, you mean the smell? And he's like, yeah, it smells like fish. Like, yeah. And he goes, all my patients are calling me now saying they're going to stop it. They didn't know that. So he published an article in Annals of Internal Medicine. It was called Metformin. It really does stink. <laughs> and I... Uh, and it's a true story. You can go find it on PubMed. And he got, he got interviewed. I was like, that's what got you to full professor and, you know, be doing all these interviews. He got interviewed by NPR. Like it was, I was like, man, what can I do to get interviewed by NPR? Uh, or somebody, you know, I'll take local news. You know, I already did enough of that with COVID, but, um, but yeah, so metformin really does stink. So, um, one of my videos on, on uh, Teach Me Farm, I did like a six minute video on Paxlovid mouth, right? Because people are talking about that, right? And dyscusia, right? It's just bad, bitter, metallic taste in your mouth. And so there's a lot of drugs that can do that. Metformin can have that metallic taste. Uh, any others? Y'all know of any others that do that? Any thoughts? Flagyl can do that. Metallic taste. Paxlovid, the ritonavir component, is kind of a metallic, bitter taste. So if patients aren't aware of a taste or a smell, they stop taking it. Or they will, or they think, try to sue, who knows what they'll do, okay? Um, so yeah, metformin, still a great drug, okay? You got to titrate slow, though. Start low and go slow. I tell our, our medical residents, they'd want to start them on a gram BID. I'm like, this isn't antibiotics. We don't start high, okay? This isn't a statin. <laughs> We don't go to 80 Lipitor. We don't skip the, you know, we skip the 20 Lipitor. We don't skip the, 
500 of metformin. I had a bariatric, so I'll save that story for bariatric surgery. But anyway, yeah, target. Do y'all use the XR formulation at all for metformin? Less diarrhea? You agree? Okay, I'm a believer. I used to think it was all hogwash. I did. I was like, you guys are liars. The company, they would come and talk to me. Um, they, uh, but my endocrinologist convinced me. She, we, we did our bariatric surgery clinic together. She goes, Chris, Chris, Chris. She's like, I promise it works. Uh, she's like, I know, I know. It's more expensive because at the time it was. And I was like, all right, well, let's, let's give it a shot. And sure enough, it did, I, it's something about, you know, bolus hitting the colon, the, the GI tract at one time causes more diarrhea than a slow release over time. Okay, very good. Now it's pretty affordable. So it's it's not near the concern that it used to. But yeah, that's, you know, from a pharmacist standpoint, I love formulation specific kind of pearls. And so uh, metformin is is definitely one of those, like, like Toprol XL, right? Have y'all ever seen a Toprol XL tablet? It has a, a split in the middle, okay? You can break a Toprol XL in half. It sounds weird because it's XL, but you can break it in half, but you can't crush it. Then it releases all at one time. So it's just kind of interesting stuff like that. Um, drug like Micardis, you know, what's the deal with Boehringer Ingelheim anyway, that company? All their drugs are in foil pack. Did you notice that? Micardis, Pradaxa, Spiriva, the old one. All of them is because water, when it get, comes in combination with the gelatin part of the capsule, degrades it and it degrades the drug. So that's why we, we try to keep those things in a, you know, if you're going to put them in a pill box, they have to stay in the foil. You can't take them out. So that's something we talk about with patients. Anyway, um, creatinine clearance cut off. So EGFR less than 30 is contraindicated between 30 and 45. As long as they were already on it and they dropped down into that, you can keep them on it. You may adjust their dose down to once a day. That would be okay. Um, the concern is lactic acidosis. Remember the biguanides we talked about at the party? Okay. So fenformin was a biguanide. And it causes a lot of lactic acidosis. Metformin really doesn't do that, okay? Um, but in rare circumstances, anybody ever seen lactic acidosis from metformin? No, right. It's an extremely rare event. I've only seen it one time. And that was because the patient came to the, uh, to the ICU, a lot of issues going on. They were found down, essentially, and their serum creatinine was 20. Not two, 20. And so they were on metformin. I mean, I'm sure their levels were astronomical. And I'm sure a lot of the lactate was high because they were found out. Anyway, they were on metformin. Don't forget about B12. So periodic testing of vitamin B12 levels should be considered in metformin patients, particularly those with anemia or peripheral neuropathy. So if you have a patient, unexplained anemia, B12 deficiency, they've been on metformin for a long time. Um, that could be at play. You can't really determine any other potential um, cause of that. So you do want to keep periodically checking this. Okay, so phonyureas, not first line, but they're cheap, right? That's why we still use them, but they do have problems, hypoglycemia. I will say they do cause a lot of weight gain too, because any drug that by its mechanism of action causes the pancreas to secrete insulin is going to cause weight gain. That was why we talked about that recommendation earlier of GLP-1s and, um, and insulin. So you're trying to use more GLP-1s. Possibly increased mortality in elderly. Glyburide is associated with that because it's got a longer half-life. So glyburide sticks around in your system for a lot longer than a glipizide will. So that's why if I'm recommending a sulfonylurea, I almost always go with glipizide. Um, over glyburide. Renal insufficiency, glipizide is again our preferred agent because glyburide will stick around for a while. Those of you on Zoom, okay, here we go. Baltimore and Miami. Very good, very good. Um, so for the rest of y'all on there, definitely put in where you're in in the chat, where you're from. Um, so like to see where everybody's from, whether it could be international. We've had Canada before, a lot of different folks. Um, I mean, Buffalo is basically right in Canada, right? Eh? A suburb of Canada, eh? Okay. 
Yeah, I've I've been to uh, Ottawa and I've been to Toronto. Um, I love Tim Hortons coffee though. I mean, it is really good coffee. I don't know if y'all ever, y'all ever had Tim Hortons coffee. It's like a Dunkin'. Although if you tell people that up there, they'll slap you. But uh, it's kind of the same like vibe. Uh, mm-hmm. It's delicious. Delicious. That was my first stop when I got there. I was like, where's Tim Hortons at? Let's go. All right. Um, but anyway, coffee may decrease your risk of diabetes. Not if you put all the stuff in it, though. All right. Um, I have to get my students to vote when I tell them what I put in my coffee. They're like, is this coffee or a milkshake? You know, which one is it? Um, so low cost, glipizide is still preferred because of those factors. All right. We're already an hour in. TZDs. Decrease overall insulin resistance, orally available. They're cheap. So again, they kind of get thrown in that sulfonylurea kind of basket. Well, let's see, somebody. Utah. Very good. Utah, man. I've never been to Utah. I've been to 35 states. That's one I haven't been to. So I got to go. But I'm very deathly afraid of skiing. Every one of the pharmacists that went skiing came back with a fracture. So I, I tell every one of them, hey, before you go skiing, do you have a good orthopedist? All right. So because uh, you may need one. They, I'm serious. They'd all come back with a fracture. It was the craziest thing. And one of my friends just moved out to Colorado. And I'm like, oh, man, here we go. Um, so TZDs, we had a lot of hope for these. But again, because of side effect, weight gain, edema, heart failure worsening, you know, Fracture risk, the, speaking of fractures, <laughs> it can increase your risk of fractures long-term. So the TZ, are y'all still using these? Actos, Avandia, a little bit? Okay, right. If it's cheap, you carry it. Oh, right, 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 403B, yeah. Gotcha, okay. Yeah. And, you know, one day we may get to that where we're able to truly do like holistic health care. That's my goal. Um, you know, I worked for the Department of Defense. That's kind of how it was. It was almost like a version of single payer health care a little bit. And it was nice to be able to see everybody's profile. One thing, like I could see anybody, what they got, what they were feeling. And then to be able to like have a holistic discussion on, you know, hey, this person's got risk for fractures. Can we avoid this agent, even though it's going to cost us a little bit more with a GLP-1. Um, so we had those discussions. That was a nice thing about my John Diabetes Clinic. You know, we even though it's the government and you think red tape, it actually was pretty easy for me to get some things. It was not bad. Uh, but part of that was cost because the government has these great contracts with these manufacturers and they get things a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, the heart failure is a big concern with this drug class. These cause a lot of uh, fluid retention. Um, any other drugs cause fluid retention? We'll do a little trivia here. What other drugs cause fluid retention? Do y'all know? Norvask. Norvask. Yeah. Peripheral edema for sure. Yep. NSAIDs can cause fluid retention. Corticosteroids, Decadron, a lot of Decadron used, right? In the last three years, COVID. Okay. Um, an interesting case this week, actually. Guy came in with COVID. Um, somebody didn't look at his profile well enough. They put him on Decadron. They gave him uh, Actemra, which is the IL-6 antibody for severe COVID. CD4 count was 80. So he has HIV. And uh, so that basically knocks your immune system down. So now we think he's got uh, PCP pneumonia. Yeah, which that's bad, right? Those immunosuppressants, but they can also, like steroids can cause fluid retention. Okay, sorry, I was getting off track. That's my number one thing in my evals from students. They're like very entertaining, loves to tangent. So really working hard, but it's really hard. Uh, this slide almost pulled it out. I don't even really like it. I'm, I'm pulling it next time, but it's just showing there are combinations of a lot of these different drugs out there. Um, are y'all combination fan of, of drugs? Hey. Which one? Soliqua. Okay, so you do use that one. Yeah. Why, why that one? Because of the drug called 
Ah, okay. And, Very uh, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the lixacinotide in there, right? Along with the insulin, try to prevent some, you know, overall high doses of insulin. So it's kind of take kind of what we talked about earlier. Yeah. The others, that's the only one I've heard people like when I go give presentations, it's Soliqua every time. The others, it just, it just hasn't really happened. Um, okay. All right. Let's go to a case. 58 year old female. She's on metformin, glipizide. A1C still not at goal. She's amenable to another therapy, but does not want any subcutaneous therapy at this time. Okay. Which of the following newer agents would you want to do? Allogliptin, exanatide, Jardiance, or a Freza insulin? What do y'all think? I mean, in an ideal world, what are you going to do? Probably Jardiance, right? But let's say she ain't going to afford that either, right? That's when we come in. And that's why I asked y'all earlier about this drug class, DPP fours. Who do y'all use these in? I'm curious. So like the Jan, you know, Genuvia, Nasina. What? What do y'all use those? At all? If they can afford it, all right. Let's say they can't afford it. When do you like to use them if they can afford it? Why do you like them, or do you, or do you not like them? Any ideas? Oh, yeah. I do a little bit of both. I worked for Walmart for 10 years. Yep. PRN, Connexus, the system. Um, so I did a little bit of both. I'd go down and get it for them. Yeah. So I'm not a huge fan of the DPP force. They're like the emperor's new clothes. You know, they have a lot of promise. It's like, hey, we're DPP4, man. Check us out. And then you look behind the curtain, and you're like, man, there ain't a whole lot there. Okay. So remember, all these drugs we've been talking about, right? They all have been, you know, mandated by the FDA to do some trials. Well, the DPP4 data has not been that great. Okay. So DPP4s, essentially what they do is they work on glucagon. Okay. They work to boost GLP-1. So a GLP-1 like Victoza, okay, this is an indirect way of boosting your endogenous GLP-1. Well, to me, that's not great. That's indirect, right? That's not the real thing. Y'all remember when Coke decided to change their formula? Bad idea, right? This to me is kind of like if I promise my kids I'm taking them to Disney World, and then I wake up that morning, I'm like, hey, kids, I'm really sorry. We're not going to Disney World. But guess what? We're going to the fair. No offense to the fair. But my point is that it's like a cheap imitation. This isn't GLP-1. You're giving them a DPP-4, right? Now, why do people use these drugs? They're oral. I mean, at the end of the day, these are oral drugs, okay? Now, what do they do clinically? They're all on combination, right, with metformin. So Genuvia becomes Janumet, right? That's what my best friend is on. I diagnosed him with diabetes. What a friend I am. He didn't think so at the time. No, true story. We were at church and he came up to me and uh, he's a uh, retired Navy. Okay. So he's, and he's got an engineering brain. So he just, it's, everything's very matter of fact. So he's like, Chris, um, I'm having chest pain. And my arm is tingling and numb and my jaw is hurting some. Do you think I should go to the ER? Of course, I'm like my back sweating. Like, am I being filmed? Like, is this on camera? You know, somebody going to tell me? Yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm going with you. He's like, why? I was like, you may be having a heart attack. He's like, what? I was like, you don't know. So. The good news is he wasn't having a heart attack. The bad news is his A1C was 7.8. He didn't know it. He was walking around. And he, he had military health care, right? He was late on his visits. Yeah, doesn't take long, okay? So uh, anyway, they, uh, he's now on Janumet. That's what he takes. And I'm kind of like, his wife will email me on the side. And like, 
he's not being real adherent with his genuine. I'm like, okay, how do I address this? Hey, your wife told me you're not taking your drugs. I was like, because if I'm getting in trouble, you're going down with me, okay? And you have to live with him, so you need to think about this. Um, but yeah, these, these are orally available. And you know, when you look in these drugs, they don't lower A1C that great. Maybe a half percent. One is very generous. Um, that's basically if you're only on metformin. Um, so they don't tolerate metformin. This is an option. It's another oral drug. But again, there's no cardiovascular outcome data for these drugs. And we'll talk about that actually right here. So side effects, some weird ones. Kind of these last three, facial edema, urticaria with uh, saxagliptin, disabling arthralgias, sort of ported with some patients, and then pancreatitis. So I, I put these up there. They're not common, especially the first two, the facial edema and the disabling. But if you get a patient on a DPP-4 and they're having kind of these weird, vague, kind of arthritis type symptoms, you, you know, kind of out of the blue, quick onset, uh, you may want to ask about that. Um, cardiovascular effects, again, really unknown at this point. There's a lot of debate on saxagliptin specifically that it may increase your risk of heart failure, which is really bad in the era of SGLT2s that we'll talk about here in just a second. Now, with the cardiovascular outcomes, there's really no data positive or negative. So far, the data is neutral. They lower blood sugar. They don't increase your risk for heart attack or stroke, but they don't really decrease your risk. When you look at this, it, it, it was not associated with lower all-cause mortality, but GLP-1s were. Again, because these are only indirect boosters of that. And so there was also a study here, the C-nodes analysis, 30,000 patients, no increase in risk of hospitalizations from these drugs. So best I can tell from the data right now, the DPP-4s are neutral when it comes to cardiovascular outcomes. So when you have a diabetes patient and you put them on this drug, you're not going to lower their risk of a heart attack or stroke, but you're not going to increase it either. This is purely a play on lowering A1C. If you need somebody to lower their A1C about a half a percent, I think this is worth it, but not out of priority. It's going to be a lower priority agent because of that. But nice thing is hypoglycemia risk is pretty low. Um, weight gain is not an issue. So there are some benefits to it, but the cardiovascular benefit so far is not there. We'll do a break in about 10 minutes just to give you all a break, stretch, get some coffee, et cetera. So at 9.30. Okay. What, now, one thing the DPP-4s have been associated with, this was published late last year in uh, British Medical Journal. They did a systematic review of DPP-4s, so all the gliptins, GLP-1s, and SGLT-2s. And they looked at all, like, 82 trials. And what they did see is that if you're on any of these drugs, you did have an increased risk of gallbladder or biliary disease, specific for the DPP-4s. And there was also a risk of cholecystitis, and this was greater risk than SGLT2s, but not GLP-1s. And so it seemed that the longer you were on these therapies, you did have more gallbladder inflammation, disease um, than uh, standard population. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind. These may be an increased risk. So if you're having patients with more gallbladder concern, issues, symptoms, and you've recently initiated DPP-4, or if they've been on one a while, this could be one thing you can do to try to decrease some of those symptoms. Okay, now the case here. 34-year-old, not well-controlled with metformin, has hypertension, he takes Norvas daily, but no other significant past medical history. So he's attempting to lose weight and wishes to know which of the following newer agents may impede his weight loss attempts. So which one of these is gonna work against him? This is just a trivia question. Which one of these do you think would work against his weight loss goals?
Any ideas? Um, so just because it's inhaled, insulin can still cause weight gain. So that would be one that would be problematic. Okay, so let's move on to our GLP-1s. Glucagon-like peptide. So GLP-1s, I remember when these first came out by, by, uh, by ADA. That was the first one I was exposed to. Um, so essentially what these drugs are doing is they're acting at the GLP-1, as GLP-1. Our body has endogenous GLP-1. And GLP-1, when it's working appropriately, does a number of important things. One, it slows gastric emptying. That's one of the major things it does, which is also what gives it its side effect profile. A lot of nausea, vomiting, potentially, um, those side effects. Decreases your appetite, kind of tells your brain it's not hungry. If you talk to people that are on GLP-1s, they will tell you they literally just do not feel hungry at all. And that's, they just, they don't want to eat. Okay. It's very good at doing that. Um, cardiovascular data, we'll talk about what's been published. Um, on the pancreas itself, maybe some decrease in beta cell death. It's a little debatable. Um, and then glucagon secretion as well. So GLP-1, like I said, it is, um, you have GLP-1 circulating, but this acts to potentiate your current GLP-1 levels. Um, which one do y'all use the most, if y'all, among the GLP-1s? Trulicity, number one. Would y'all agree with that? For those of you who use the GLP-1. Yeah, historically, when I go from city to city, it's Trulicity, number one. Why do you like Trulicity? Yeah, single dose, so once a week. And then what was the other thing? Just weekly. Yeah, it's just easy to do, okay? Um, some patients, I like the fact that you don't have to, like, look at the needle when they inject it. So people who have a real problem with needles, um, Mongero is kind of the same way and that they don't have to see it. It just goes in. Um, but yeah, Trulicity. And now it's got some pretty good outcome data to back it up. For a while, we were questioning its data, but now it's got enough data to back it up. But yeah, GLP-1s for sure. You've got Trulicity, Bidurion. <laughs> I used to train people on Bidurion, like how to do it. It was like a pump shotgun. It was like shh, shh, the old. Yeah, I remember it was just. It was like awful, y'all. And I'm like, how can anybody do this? Like, even I'm having trouble. I'm a trained professional. Um, yeah, it was crazy, crazy. But now, now they they have revamped it to the pen. It's it's a lot easier to do now. But we'll talk about Bidurion here in just a second. But yeah, there are a number of good options out there. Um. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And I do some consulting for industry, but like the, I remember the first inhaled insulin product from Pfizer. I mean, it truly was like a pump shotgun. Like they tried to show it to me, like on the side. I was like, how is anybody get, like, he couldn't do it. And I was like, and then it went. They voluntarily pulled it, you know, because it just it was just too hard. I pro, I applaud them for trying, um, but it was just too hard. Um, so yeah, so GLP ones are game changers. Uh, they lower your A one C pretty good, one to one and a half percent, depending on the dose. Um, if you're able to titrate that dose up, uh, side effect profile: GI, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, caution in patients with pancreatitis. Remember, though, if they have any history of medullary thyroid carcinoma, that is an absolute black box warning contraindication in the package insert. Um, I did run across somebody with that one time. I did think I was being filmed by like Dateline or something. I was like, is this really on their profile? Like, you know, they're like, 
like my, uh, you know, just wonder like, man, it's like, wow, this is it. And sure enough, it was true. And so we weren't able to give it to them. Um, but the weight loss is, is tremendous. I mean, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. So a couple of trials, I won't bore you with a bunch of trials, but I will go through a few, some of the major ones. So the leader trials now almost seven years old, but this was the first big one that established certain GLP ones decrease your risk of cardiovascular death. So nearly uh, somewhere close to 9,340 patients. So a lot of patients, type 2 diabetes with high cardiovascular risk. I apologize, it's got off somehow. Um, but that MACE outcome, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, cardiovascular death. So who's in my study? 64-year-old, about two-thirds male, about 80% white. Um, that's why one of the, in the 2023 uh, guidelines, uh, you know, really trying to get our studies designed to include all uh, patient populations, because this does not apply to, in the, especially in the Southern United States, to a lot of African-American. We have a lot, Hardyville, where I live, is a ton of uh, Hispanic population. And so I, it's hard for me to apply some of these studies to those patient populations. So we're trying to do a better job of getting those patients enrolled. Um, but part of the problem right now is distrust with healthcare, like getting patients to actually come into these trials. They, they, they just don't trust a lot of people in healthcare and COVID's made that 10 times worse as we know. Um, BMI 32 and a half. I mean, Savannah, I'll take that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but, uh, just kidding. But, um, 58% coronary disease. Type 2 diabetes, most people had it about 12, almost 13 years, so a long time. So what were the outcomes? All right, a little statistics here. So if you want to calculate a number needed to treat, all you have to do is take the two numbers, 14.9, this was the primary outcome, and 13, you subtract it, so that's 1.9, okay? One divided by 0 0.019. So you take that 1.9%, turn it into a decimal. So that's 0 0.019. One divided by 0 0.019. That's the only stats lesson I'll give you the day, okay? But why do we do this? And it's because it makes it into a number that I can easily talk to a patient about. So I can say, hey, if, if I put you on Victoza and I treat you for two years, but the studies, I only have to treat about 53 people to prevent one heart attack, stroke, MI. That's pretty good, right? What's a good number, right? That's, that's really the better question. Like, is this a good number? And I will tell you for a hard outcome like death, hospital, that's a really good number. Go back to Zocor. I love Zocor. I don't know why. I just love the drug. Okay, I love talking about it. And one of the initial Zocor studies was called the 4S trials. Anybody remember this trial? The Scandinavian Simvastatin Survival Study, four S's, right? Boom, 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 okay? Guess how many patients were in the study? 4,444. I'm not making this up. Guess what the number needed to treat was to prevent? It was. And I'm like, how did they make this work out? Like, there's got to be some ethical problems here, you know? But it was true. That's how it worked. Go look it up. Go look it up later today uh, while you're at the pool. All right. So, um, so 53 is actually a really good number. Okay. And then in the 70s, for any cause death or cardiovascular death, game changer. Victoza went to the top of the guidelines. It's what we want to use. Okay. Um, now, other drugs haven't been as mm, good in their outcomes. This is exanatide by Durian, okay? This is the Excel study. Excel, they didn't really excel, okay? But what they did show in 15,000 patients, in their primary outcome, they were not able to show a statistically significant benefit on their primary outcome. The way you know this, is if your confidence interval, your hazard ratio includes one, the number 1.0, it's not significant. It's not, it's close. 
It was close. Okay. But it did it. So it was trend there, but I mean, you're talking about 15,000 patients. It should have worked. Okay. Now, why did it not have the same outcomes as Victoza? It's a good question. A couple things, a couple reasons. I this is Bland's postulates. Okay. I haven't published that. All right. But one thing is maybe Victoza is better, right? What's always the thing, right? We worry about drugs all within a class. You can't necessarily say they're all the same. We love to think that. Like, for example, are all ACE inhibitors the same? Ah, probably. I mean, they're all got pretty good data. Lysinopril, Ramapril, okay, Enalapril. But then yeah, I talked about Resilin. It got pulled off the market, right? Y'all ever heard of Baycol? Cereva statin, y'all remember that statin? Oh, yeah. That's my favorite thing to teach pharmacy students. So when you hear Zocor or Lipitor or Crestor, you think doses of 20, 40, 80, right? Baycol's dose was 0.4 and 0.8. Rawr. Potency, man. It fried muscles. So within like a year of it being like on the market, like heavy. So I know this very much because the Department of Defense put it on formulary because it was dirt cheap. And we were seeing more rhabdomyolysis than we had ever seen with all the statins combined. So that's why you have to be careful to say, okay, if it's in this class, it does this. It's going to be equivalent. You can't do that. That's why studies have to be done individually. So the leader trial, maybe Victoza is just better. The Victoza trial was also a year longer. So maybe it was able, the longer you're on it, you're able to show those outcomes. And I wonder if this would have gone longer, would they have seen it? I don't know. Number three, the A1C was about a percent higher in the Victoza trial. So they had more room to bring that A1C down. Maybe that could have caused that. Here's what I think it was, though, part of it. So we didn't know it at the time because this trial was done, you know, six years ago. But the standard of care actually had some SGLT2 inhibitors in there. Now, we know they decreased mortality. So if they'd have known that, they would have kept them out because <laughs> the Victoza did not have them in there. Okay. And the adherence was lower due to difficulty with the injection. Shocking. That was the pump shotgun, right? So it was hard to do. All right, Trulicity, everybody's favorite, right? So Trulicity in the Rewind study followed up for five years, and it did decrease the risk of non-fatal MI stroke, cardiovascular death. It's once a week. It's really taken over. Approved to reduce the risk of MACE in patients with established cardiovascular disease. So Trulicity, by far, I would say, is the top GLP-1 for diabetes for diabetes that's used. Do y'all agree with that? When you can. Oh, 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 Ozempic, you know. It's in your head now, isn't it? What a commercial. You know, I make fun of these drugs. You know, they meet with me all the time, right? Because they see me as the problem, okay? So they're like, all right. But I tell them, I'm like, hey, the, the, your commercial's pretty good sticks in my head. So I know it's in my patient's head. Okay. But yeah. So semaglutide, man, there's lots of semaglutide out there. You can find it depending. Okay. But Ozempic. Okay. So Ozempic once weekly, 3,300 patients reduce the risk of these outcomes. Ultimately the FDA did approve it to reduce cardiovascular events in patients with type two diabetes and cardiovascular disease. This is a big deal, right? Are y'all using some Ozempic? Are, are y'all able to use any of it? Yeah, you can find it, right? Okay, a lot of shortage of these things right now. GLP-1s are really hard to find, right? So o -O -O, Ozempic, it's got some pretty good data. Now, oh, it's 9.34. I lied to y'all. I'd get bad evals if I were my class. Let's do a 10-minute break just to kind of take a break. You guys have been going hard for an hour and a half. So 9.45, we'll get going again. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that.